The street had been expecting comp sales growth of nearly 5%, but the pizza chain instead only grew by 3 as it continues its so-called for fortressing strategy. Uh, Kate, you've been following all day long. It's been a pretty good stock after that. They, they redid it a couple of years ago. That's right. And it, it's done pretty well. But this is a little bit of a hiccup, no? That's right. So CEO Rich Allison, he'll be on Mad Money tonight. So I'm sure Jim will grill him about all of this. But they are in the midst of this fortressing strategy. So that means they're opening up more locations that are closer to their existing locations. Analysts say that could be a drag on same-store sales in the U.S., for the time being, because you may go to the newer dominoes instead of the older ones. Rich Allison says even though this is a drag on comps for now, it'll be a strategy that pays off in the long term. Another thing that came up a lot today, as it did last quarter, these third-party delivery aggregators. They're under a lot of pressure because in the past, the only thing you could get delivered was pizza, right? Now you can get Chipotle, you can get Taco Bells, you can get other pizza other places pizza, that have yeah. teamed up with Grubhub and DoorDash and the likes. They do all of their delivery in-house. That's really essential to the Domino's formula, so to speak, and it, it has proven successful in the past. You know, these third parties are being heavily subsidized. They're deeply discounting. He questions the sustainability of that long term, but it's obviously impacting the company. We should talk about fortressing and what that is, guys, because yeah. fortressing is a concept by which you are going to put a Domino's as close to everybody you possibly mm -hmm. can. What that's going to do is, in essence, take away from same store sales, because if you're that much closer to a Domino's, you go from there. But this is an investment a lot of investors had already been willing to make mm -hmm. because they knew that comp store sales were going to decline the more stores you opened up. But it does compete more effectively with third party sellers because Everybody then can get a pizza within five minutes. And the right? delivery is cheaper. Versus, versus the delivery is cheaper. For right. the, for the right. store. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's the reason why. I mean, so that's where the, the stock has gone up. It sells off today because of a sell the news type situation. Yeah, but I'm not sure if it's a long-term bad thing. They're looking to get to 8,000 locations in the U.S. in the next decade. Yeah. So this is a huge part of that strategy. I don't know. If you're hungry, aren't you ordering based on taste and price? And there's uh, pizza places are ubiquitous. So if Domino's can't compete on taste and price for pizza, I'm willing to say, okay, maybe they're not competing with Chipotle. Maybe they're not competing with the local Greek restaurant, but they are competing with pizza places. And wouldn't their money be better invested competing on taste and price? But you're forgetting, they, one, they, well, you're, you're forgetting one variable. If you're that hungry, isn't it about time as well? I, but, I, but, right? but Seamless I mean, is delivering the food in a timely fashion. I mean, you know, that the, the alternate strategy would be like, what, to throw in the towel on their delivery fortress mm -hmm. and just say if we can't beat they them, join them. They did quickly do a big taste overhaul under Patrick Doyle, they the did. former CEO. They, he got, went on TV job. and yeah. said the pizza didn't taste good. They overhauled the they recipe. Did. People seem happier with it, but... And it'll taste better if it's only five minutes to get there. Right. Yeah. It's hot and it's fresh. GPS tracking, too, coming by the end of this year, so you can actually see where the pizza is, not just on the app, but... Not a know. product endorsement, Joe, but I did order it last night because there's a promo I, We for get 50%. a lot of Domino's. Yeah. Uh, in my, sometimes we pick it up just uh, because, the you know, you think they're all the same. We go to the one that makes better Domino's, yeah. and it, they don't there deliver to where we are. So it does matter. Which it's also one, cheaper when you pick it up you yourself. Go to. It's much cheaper. It's yeah. $8.52. Yeah. I'm going to shut up now. It's exactly $8.52. Yeah. I'm not kidding. Be sure to tune in to Mad Money tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time for Jim Cramer's exclusive interview with Domino's CEO, Rich Allison. All right. Contessa, I invited you over here for this. Are you ready? I'm born ready. All right. This, you are. Okay. <laughs> IKEA is closing its only manufacturing site in the U.S., citing... Uh, the high cost of raw materials. I think they're talking about Yeah, so Joe. Wood, are they not? Uh, it's going to shift operations from Danville, uh, Virginia, to its existing facilities in Poland and Portugal because it's more affordable to manufacture. Them. So IKEA's grand American experiment is much like its furniture disposable. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. It's, uh, you, you can't compete with raw materials. I mean, we're hearing this not just from IKEA. We're hearing it across industries that as uh, input costs are rising, that companies are seeing their margins shrinking. If IKEA knows, and it should know because it has existing facilities and manufacturing um, centers in Europe, that they can do things cheaper in Europe, then why wouldn't they? They gave it a shot. It didn't work. Well, my, my <clears> thing <throat> is, is about in, if input costs are rising, those input costs are sourced locally, right? So it's not like, I mean, there's no arbitrage that can be made or maybe one should be made about lumber prices or wood prices that are happening elsewhere in Europe versus the United States or Canada. It seems to me like if it's just input costs, those would eventually flow through, globally speaking, just from a financial instrument standpoint. Well, they said, look, they said that they were going to cut 7,500 jobs in this big restructuring deal. 
that would result globally in a gain of 11,500 jobs. And we've seen this coming for Danville. Danville says they lived up to their bargain. They invested what they were going to invest, that they think it was a net benefit to the, the center itself. They weren't willing to give them whatever tax incentives would have been mm. needed to offset what IKEA thought. I would so. say the company is going to help them find jobs. That's yeah. the big mm -hmm. thing about this yeah, whole process as well. Yeah. All right. Our next topic uh, is a, one of my favorites, uh, not TD Ameritrade, uh, but Millennials, out with its 2019 uh, Young Money Survey. And I, I like the topic because I like to make fun of them, really. But it's not fair because <laughs> I'm surrounded by three of them uh, right I, here. I am not a millennial. These are people 22 to 28. Contessa, no. Uh, I was just I'm trying definitely to be not nice. 22 yeah. to 28. But we do she's have 28. One. We do have one bona fide uh, the millennial maybe, here. Maybe not. Yeah. 19 percent of young millennials, at 22 to 20, expect to be financially reliant, <laughs> and they admit it, uh, on their parents into their 30s. Hey, what, you know, what do you want from me? Uh, that's almost double the number of uh, the following generation, Gen Z, most of whom expect to be financially independent uh, by the age of 25. Do you have anything? non-disparaging to say about this story, something that, that can maybe motivate this group of people? I, I would say this. I think that I was more financially independent by the time I was 23 to 25. I'm a Gen Zer. I'm on the, I'm on the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. But it was about trying to, you know, find a job out of college. Now, I will say this. Uh, I, I, unlike many millions of Americans, did graduate with no college debt. So that was the one thing that my parents did for me that a lot of folks don't have the benefit of. Right. Now, the lesson I learned from that is the moment my daughter was born and she got a tax ID number, what was the first thing I did? Open up a 529 plan. Because uh, the, 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 that's the biggest gift that I can give my kid. Is because to pay what for you're college. saying is college debt is equal to what you would spend on a debt yeah, payment I mean, it's on a massive. House. There's no you've doubt. Got a, you've got a kid in high school and a kid in college. Will you welcome them home and open your doors post college? I wouldn't just welcome them home. I would bribe them. Yes, yeah, stay oh. home with me. To, to, to so this, is, this is the other part of it, is that parents are saying that their kids are their best friends. The, the kids are saying, my parents are my best friends. It's that our culture is changing and the expectations are changing. And how about this? This survey also says most young Americans would buy a car before other financial commitments like saving for retirement, paying rent, investing, and paying for health insurance. I thought Uber and Lyft were supposed think to be doing away anything. with... Yeah. Uh, they don't buy houses, they don't buy cars. Like, as the no, only millennial, right. can I chime in here? Yes, you're, and uh, you're an anti-millennial. I you... don't rely on my parents. I graduated with a lot of college debt, actually, yeah. that I worked very hard to pay off. Uh, also, my parents are on my Netflix account, so I just want to say I'm not mooching off of you. You can use my Netflix account anytime. They would probably welcome me home if I did. Now Netflix is home. after you. But uh, <laughs> I think my parents would definitely know, welcome me home. I, I haven't had to. We got to do this. I hope we, the audio guy has some um, like the applause button. Finally, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue is opening a massive men's luxury shoe department at its flagship store in New York City. The sector has become its fastest growing business, and now Saks is looking to cash in on male footwear. And look at this. For more, let's bring in Courtney Reagan. Courtney Woo! Reagan, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Courtney Reagan, we don't need it. First rapid fire, your first walk on rapid fire? For, I think it might be for me. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you have $895 sneakers? I've you seen them. I've seen some crazy ones at Zenia. Funny He's that you're wearing you a Zenia that. suit right now. I am, <laughs> but they showed me these shoes, and it's He's like. He's such a fashion trendsetter. Oh, yeah, that's me. You so you're going to have the Lululemon. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to check out Saks. They're opening up this new men's department, so they're going through this $250 million multi year renovation. The women's department for shoes has its own zip code. You're probably familiar with that, or maybe your wife is, 30,000 square feet. This one isn't going to be that big, but it's going to be 60% bigger than it was. They're going to have 60 brands, tons of exclusives, 2,000 different pairs of shoes. You could buy a $65 pair of Pumas or an $895 pair of Balenciagas or an $11,000 pair of Alligator Loafers. Hey. And this is a really yeah. big growth segment, actually. We know where actually. those are coming from. The yeah, poor, this poor is... guy in Chicago. Um, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Charlie, the, Charlie, the... Charlie, yeah. the... Yeah. I guess, you know, don't look at me for this, because I, I was wearing a pair of crappy Cole Hans for like 12 years that I kept getting resold. This is not... This does not do it for me. Which tells you that they're yeah. not crappy. Right. Well, no, they're okay. If you're wearing them for no, I have years. had them redone right. a bunch of times, but I, it's not a big deal for me. I don't. What, what, what? So, for a lot of men, it is, and it turns out that luxury shoes, and right now it's these luxury sneakers, are sort of their gateway, gateway drug into other luxury categories. So, it's first they get this really high end sneaker, and oftentimes it's this streetwear fad. And then they move into a designer T-shirt and a designer jeans. I mean, Saks says that their men's luxury shoes business up 50% over the last three years. Do you own a pair of Manolo? I do not. I, I, I Courtney and I would believe we, in We buy those. Do you? I have hand-me-downs. Yeah. You? 
Not worth it. Co- we're, we're, I'm not very, I bought, we're I bought very things, frugal. We're very frugal. I bought things secondhand. Also, this is yes. why they're living with their parents. They're Dom, spending eight hundred. My wife does not right. own Manolo blocks. No Manolo. No. What's the other kind? Jimmy Choo or Jimmy Choo? I think right? she might have a Jimmy Choo.